Here we are in the book of Romans, lesson number eight. And we've just been talking about the plan of salvation and the way in or those who God has predestined or God has chosen or those God has elected to be saved. It's those who believe in the spoken word about Christ. So our work of evangelism is more important than we could even imagine because they can't even believe unless they've heard. So God started the process by sending us. And by obeying his sent word, we go preach. And when we preach, they hear. And when they hear, they can believe. Is that an automatic? No, they still. There's where the human choice comes in. Human choice is believing. God has chosen sovereignly that this is the path of salvation. And he's going to give you a choice. Now, why would he give you a choice? Because he wants you to love him from your heart. If he just made you as a robot where you had to love, you were just programmed to love him. No, he's going to have you hear the good news and he's going to take every effort to get people to believe. And he's going to use his church to do that. So thank you for your work in the kingdom of God because you telling the good news is really critical to people being saved. So then we see the latter part, because he just said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But then he starts with a question. But I say, have they not yet heard? And he's really talking about Israel. Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world are the message of the prophets. Did I not say, did not Israel know? Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. He's setting up message of salvation to the Gentiles. But Israel is very bold, or Isaiah is very bold when he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Actually, Psalm 19, verse 4, is a prophecy of David against Israel because they did not believe, although they heard. And Moses and Isaiah, giving the text for Deuteronomy 32 and Isaiah 65, prophesied that the salvation of the Gentiles came because of the rejection of the Jews of the gospel. And then, of course, Isaiah 65, verse 2, also tells us that God repeatedly reached out to Israel, which we're going to see in Romans chapter 11. Let's look at that. Look at verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Because he chose the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. Has he cast his people away? Certainly not. For I am, Paul says, an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or did, did you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed the prophets and torn down your altar, altars, and I am left alone. I'm the only one who believes, is what he was saying. And they seek my life. But what does the divine response to him say? I have reserved for myself. 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But, it is of wor if, but if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. Now that just sounds like redundancy, but he is trying to drive home a point. 
notice he answers very emphatically. Has God rejected the nation of Israel? No. Get that clear. He hasn't rejected them. But he has a remnant that is saved by grace. And then he gets into this conversation and makes it very clear. If you're depending on works, it's not grace. And if you're depending on grace, then it's not works. He said, otherwise, these words don't mean what we think they mean. We've redefined works if we think it's the way to grace. And we've redefined grace if we think that works is how you get there. He says, no, God has elected. Now, we already just came out of chapter 10. Remember, every verse lives somewhere. He's already said what he's elected. He's elected those who believe. So when Paul says, I'm an Israelite and I'm saved, he's actually saying, I'm believed. And we, of course, can read that in Paul's story in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, where he recounts his salvation experience. And so, first told of his experience, and then a recount in chapter 22 and 26. So then, we pick up in verse 7. What then? Israel has not attained what it seeks, but the elect has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. Now, this is really important because, you know, Jesus gave a parable of the seed. And, of course, it's recounted in Matthew chapter 13 and also in Mark chapter 4. And I've I've studied that parable repeatedly, also repeated in Luke's gospel. But the thing is about the principle of the seed. When he said, these are those by the wayside where they heard the word, and Matthew's gospel adds the phrase, and did not understand God makes it clear that they closed their eyes and they closed their ear. Those who close their eyes and close their ear, he gives them a spirit of stupor. (laughs) And and we already saw in chapter 1, really a reprobate mind or a mind void of judgment. Maybe sometimes you've tried to share your faith with other people and you think, how could they be so hard? And we talked about Pharaoh's heart in chapter 9 and that the Lord hardened his heart. But when you read the story of Pharaoh, this is really important. It does say that the Lord, and the Lord told Moses ahead of time, you're going to have a little bit of difficulty with this. His heart is hardened. But you read through the passages and see how many times when, of course, Moses came with miracles and came with all kinds of signs and wonders and even plagues and But it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And then it also says Pharaoh hardened his heart. You really need to know this. Because you see, there are times in your life where you've been the same kind of ground. Maybe you've been that ground by the wayside where you didn't understand it. So you just, it just went away. It was like the birds of the air came and stole the seeds. Or it's like your heart was hard. So the seed came, it sprung up really quickly. You were so excited, you were filled with joy, but the sun came out, pressures, and Jesus was very clear, tribulations and persecutions came and you wilted. Or you had a lot of thorns. You had the cares of this world, the deceit and its riches, lust of other things, and the seed grew up, but it got choked out by all the things inside of your heart and life. Well, here's what happens. The Word of God, has the power to soften your heart or to harden your heart. And it really has to do with your response to it. This is why he put in chapter 10 to those who believe, those who call, those who confess. It is the embracing by faith, receiving what he said and say, I believe you. You said it, you did it, I believe it. And that it is that open heart that believes. By the way, you know this in relationships, that you could measure the quality of any relationship. I've often told couples that I've counseled, I wish that I had a trust meter because I could put this trust meter on your marriage and tell how strong it is because the lower your trust level, and listen, there are things that we do in our marriages that diminishes the trust, and then we have to rebuild the trust. 
because the quality of the relationship is in the trust. That's because that's the way love is. Real love has a trusting relationship. Now, God loved us before we did anything, but we respond to his love or we believe it. As John would write in 1 John chapter 4, we have known and believed the love that God has to us, 1 John 4 verse 16. So relying on or putting faith in his love. And if you don't, guess what? Your eyes get blinded, your ears get closed, and you have a spirit of stupor. You can't understand. David says it this way. Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and recompense to them and their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. And he was talking about those who reject God. Israel's rejection is not final. And that's the heading of my New King James Version. It says, I say then, and we're reading verses 11 through 21, have they not stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now in their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches of the Gentiles. How much more their fullness? So he said if their fall did something, for all of us who were not Jews and under the natural seed of Abraham, how much more would it be if they came to the fullness of Christ? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Which, by the way, just a little parenthetical statement, God can give calls to people, to specific groups of people. And, of course, Peter was an apostle to the Gentiles, or to the Jews. And Paul stated that in, his, in one of his letters, too. So there was this specific group of people. What he goes on to say in verse 14, If by any means I might provoke them to jealousy, those who are my flesh, and save some of them. Remember, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was quite proud of that and bragged on it in Philippians chapter 3. For if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, what would their acceptance be? But life from the dead. We want to see the Jewish people saved. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So he's really... And I, I wish I had time to unpack all this, but in Ephesians chapter 2, he does. Christ came and he broke down the middle wall of partition between us. And the wall was between Jew and Gentile. And he said he has broken down that wall of partition between two groups of people, which is foundational to Paul's gospel that he's preaching to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So he says, you were used to make them jealous, but he said, don't rub it in their face. That's basically what he's saying. Don't rub it in their face because you are supported by the root. That's why we call it the Judeo-Christian ethic. Because the, the Christian church embraced all of the Old Testament as their scriptures. And then the New Testament. And we already talked about how we need both of those and how they work with each other. But he goes on to say in verse 19, for Will, say, will you say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in? Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. This is really important section. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. And this phrase of course, leaves the window for the fact that salvation could be lost. Now, I won't take the time at, the, at, at this segment 
to talk about the, the loss of salvation. I make a distinction between being saved and, and having no way of being lost whatsoever and eternal security. But our salvation is eternally secure in Christ. And, and Paul throws in a phrase in Colossians chapter 1, and he says we're walking in this if we continue in faith. He leaves that little window that the way we got in is through believing. The way we got, get out is by forsaking all that we believe. But the scriptures have got a lot of conditions for that. Let me, let me put it to you another way. I think there's a lot of times that people are asking, how far can I go to lose my salvation? Now, I've been studying the Bible for a long time, and I told you that I've been teaching the book of Romans since 1982 pretty intensely. And every year, or in some context every year, through Bible school or through midweek Bible studies, and that doesn't mean I've mastered the book of Romans. I still have some mysteries in the book of Romans that I'm digging to understand. But here's what I've come to, to know. We're talking about how many sins can I commit or how far can I go to lose my salvation. And I don't think God even makes that line clear. Maybe because he understands human nature and when we know where a line is, we go stand on it. And the Bible and the story of the New Testament is not about how far from God can you get to lose it? No, it's all about being close to him, being reconciled to him. <laughs> and, and so it is, it is really about a relationship with him. He doesn't want to say, I mean, what if you were talking in your marriage partnership and you said, well, I'll tell you what. You can do this, 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 this. You can get on the edge of these sins and you can get on these edges of betrayal. But if you step over this one, you're out of here. No, listen, we don't want to live on the edge as far away from each other as we can. We want to live close. So I'm not even trying to answer the question. The Bible gives some hints and indications and he tells you here, don't get prideful about them because you could be cut off like they were cut off. But why were they cut off? Notice that phrase in verse 20, because of unbelief they were broken off. Notice that he really summarizes this in verse 22 through 24. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who failed severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is by wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature, or you were put into the Jewish olive tree, but it wasn't your tree. He says, and you were cultivated an olive tree by being grafted in, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their olive tree? Paul is not trying to prove that you're going to lose it. He's trying to prove that Israel is going to find it. That's his point here. And in the middle of that, he again gives us the judgment of God, which we already saw as part of the gospel, because on them fell wrath. And why did fall wrath? Because of belief. Notice the gospel that we started with. It's the power of God to salvation, Jew first, also to the Gentiles, on all those who believe. And he said then the gospel is the righteousness of God that is by faith, and it is also the wrath of God upon all ungodliness and wickedness. So that two natures of God that we discussed, the love of God and the judgment of God. So he said, on them fell severity. On us fell goodness. If we continue in that goodness, but how do you get in the goodness? By belief. How do you not get the goodness? By unbelief. He's making it very clear. 
See how this salvation and righteousness by faith is being reinforced over and over and over again. Paul hasn't changed his theme. This gospel is to everyone who believes. But if you don't believe it, you can't be saved. I had a gentleman, and I just interviewed him last night on a testimony for what's about to be in the time frame I'm in right now, Father's Day service. And I met him five years ago. And he came in my office and he said, well, I just want you to know I've been coming to church here. And he said, I'm here because I need some health insurance. And there's a company who said I had to go to church to get it, the insurance. <laughs> and so he said, but I just want you to know I don't believe any of it. And he said, I want you to prove to me that God exists. I said, well, I don't want to disappoint you, but I can't prove that God exists. I said, let me tell you what God says about it. That faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you cannot see. Faith is our evidence in the unseen world. And I said, then verse 6 of that same passage says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I said, if you're not seeking to know God and you've already decided there is no God, you cannot come to God. And he got frustrated and he shared in his testimony. He said, I was boiling when I left your office and I pondered on that all night long. He said, I stayed awake reading the book of John. He said, I was trying to understand it. Of course, John said, I've written all these things that you might believe. And, and John is the one who said <laughs> that in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish and find everlasting life. Just only the very next day he came into my home because I'd actually called him over. I thought he was a, a locksmith, but he wasn't. He was actually a building inspector. And so, but when he came in, he said, I want, I want to come in your home. And we came in and we talked. And this is the first words. He said, I just want you to know I believe. He started our Bible school. He's preached at our church. He's had, and he's now doing world missions. And he's a businessman. And he still has his business, but he's so involved in world missions. Why? Because he had a saving grace of Jesus Christ, but because he believed his heart had been hardened. Matter of fact, in our conversation, and he's made this public knowledge or I wouldn't be sharing it, but in our meeting, I said, you know what? His name's Dave. I said, Dave, I don't think you're a non-believer. I think you're a disappointed believer because he had had an experience as a young person, but through a, several events that had happened in his life, he gave up on his faith of his childhood and he became a disappointed believer. He was a confessed atheist for 30 years but he was more disappointed believer than he was an atheist. And I think that there's a lot of people in that place. Well, what we're finding here is that we are in because of belief. They are out because of unbelief. Belief is the center of us coming into this gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not because we, we made the move first. God made the move first. He made it available to us. He reached out to us. His Holy Spirit compels the heart. But we have to believe. You have to yield your heart to say, okay, I believe. Then in verse 25, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all of Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, which Jacob's name was changed to Israel. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now this phrase, all Israel will be saved, sounds like a universalist view of the Jewish people. Every Jew will eventually be saved. But remember, every verse lives somewhere, and we already saw in chapter 9. They are not all Israel who are Israel. 
It's not the natural seed, but those who are of the seed of promise. If we be Christ. So he's giving a promise. I'm going to save Jacob or Israel. And I have a covenant with them that I will take away their sins. But where is that covenant? It's the new covenant. It is the covenant of Christ. That is the only way. And Jesus stated this while he was on earth. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, now I'm one of the ways. There's a lot of people say, well, all roads lead to God. No, there's just one. And Jesus is the one. So the sins can only be taken away through Christ. And then let's pick up in verse 28 here. He says, concerning the gospels, gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. But as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these have now been disobedient, that through mercy shown to them, they may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy upon all. This is so beautiful. And notice that he's really talking about the election of Israel. I've chosen this, this nation, but of course, when he gave that promise to Abraham, remember, it was to all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth. So it included the Gentiles, even in his promise to Abraham. But he says, they're beloved because of the fathers. God wants to keep his promise and his promises throughout the Old Testament that he's going to save Jacob. He's being very specific about that. Jacob's downline is going to be a part of this because you see we have Abraham and then Isaac and Isaac uh, and Ishmael, the two nations, Jewish and the Arab world because Hagar was an Egyptian woman that also carried Abraham's child. And so there's this division here. But then Isaac has two sons and Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau. Esau becomes the Edomites throughout the Old Testament. But then, of course, the story of the Bible follows Jacob because that is the seed of the promise. And God had given the promise even to Rebecca that the, that war and that fight that was going on inside of her womb was two nations and two kinds of people. And that the younger, the elder, would serve the younger, which was totally against the culture. It happened with Ishmael and Isaac, too, because there were 13 years. Ishmael was the firstborn. And that's, of course, in the Quran is why the, is, the Islamic movement, written by Muhammad in 600 A.D., really 2,000, 2,100 years between the writing of Moses and the writing of Muhammad. But that's why he actually says that they're the seed of Abraham and they're heirs to all the things because he's the firstborn. But God had chosen Isaac, and he was very clear in the Old Testament, 2,100 years. Now, you got two deeds here. The land belongs to this group or belongs to this group. Well, let's find the oldest deed because that was the first one issued. And God issued that to Isaac and his seed which is a very critical point and not off the point at all here because he's telling us that God has chosen Jacob and that is the downline of Isaac and it is through him that this promise is going to be kept and he said it's because of his promise to the fathers. God promised Abraham. God promised Isaac. God promised Jacob and God promised Joseph. And so you can go through all of the promises that were given through the seed. It's an interesting study, and maybe you can do this sometime. Go through the seed. Uh, just the word seed, do a research, because God gave a promise of a seed. He already set up a principle that every seed produces after its own kind, and then he created man after his kind. We were made in the image and likeness of God. But then in chapter 3, verse 15, he gives a promise of Christ who's going to be coming of the seed of woman, and woman doesn't have a seed, so he's really prophesying the virgin birth of Christ, and that that seed is going to crush the head of Satan. 
and Satan's going to bruise his heel. And so you find really the whole epic war of the universe being promised through the seed. Well, then follow the seed. Even in Noah, he said, I want you to get all the animal world and I want you to get your family and put it on an ark so that the seed will be saved. And then he reinstates the promise of the seed. He said, is there's day and night, seed time and harvest? He said, we're back to what I planned, that you're going to be fruitful and multiply. So <laughs> sometimes the Bible just becomes all one big story to me, and I'm sure it does you. And the more you study it, the more you're going to see. That's why I said, take the whole book. Don't just take a little isolated verse and build a whole theology on it. See what the Bible says about that idea because it will get bigger and bigger as you do, and it will become whole of one story. So then he tells us in verse 33, Oh, the depths and the riches both of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall not be repaid to him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory <laughs> forever. Amen. Look at these passages here. We kind of whiz through verse 29. Uh, well, let's, let's look at this point right here. Enemies of the gospel, but election because of the patriarchs. Although the Jewish people rejected it, God had given promises to the patriarchs, or the fathers, as he uses in this passage. And he's referring to the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he puts this little verse in verse 29, which is so powerful. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Or the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, the King James Version. I tell people that that's good news and bad news. When God gives you, uh, let me tell you two things about it. Gifts and callings are always tandem. You remember Jesus' story in Matthew chapter 25 about the talents? It says to, to that he called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. A lot of you have felt and answered a call in your life. You wouldn't be in a synergy school if you didn't believe that somehow you had a special call. You may not even know what that call is yet. But actually, this idea of gifts and callings are ever going to help you. Because the fact is, maybe you're only aware of a call. I remember when I was just a teenager, I think I was 16 years old, when I sensed a call of God upon my life. God is calling me into ministry. I was paralyzed with fear of public speaking. Matter of fact, my pastor, we had like some of my friends also answer the call to ministry. So our pastor was very gracious. He would give Sunday night services to the young preachers. And my friends would preach on Sunday nights. Now he did this occasionally, maybe one Sunday night a month. And he'd have a different one of us uh, invited to the pulpit. And he gave me the pulpit more than once. But I called him every time on a Saturday night. I said, Pastor, I just can't do it. I was so paralyzed with pub public speaking. I led a youth group in our high school that grew from six to 130 before school every day, but I always had a guest speaker. I was the leader. I was called the president of the Campus Crusade for Christ group, but I always had a speaker. Now, I could lead the worship, and I could sing, and, and I, I could be a worship leader as long as I was singing, I was okay. I could do special music, but I couldn't even introduce a song because I was so fearful of public speaking. How in the world could I ever be a minister? I just thought, this is impossible. But listen, listen to what Gifts and Callings tell me. He called his own servants and delivered unto them the goods. If you've got the call, you've got the gifts. You've got the empowerment inside of there somewhere because when he gave you the call, he gave you the gifts. Because listen to the story. Jesus said, to one he gave five, to another two, and to another one. Maybe I'm not a five. 
Matter of fact, I, I'm not like my son, Chris. I'm not like my wife, Stephanie. I'm not like my son, Daniel. They have multiple talents and multiple gifts. I'm pretty unigifted in some ways. Maybe the gift of pastor, teacher, and the gift of leadership, but I don't have all the incredible talents and gifts. that I'm not a five at all. I've studied under some fives, and they really bless my life, but that's not the point that Jesus gave in his parable. The point was, will you be faithful with what he gave you? Because if you'll be faithful to the call, the gifts are in there somewhere, and I, I quip, but it's really not a joke at all. The first time I preached, only I believed I was called. No one who heard me believed it, not even my wife. It took about my third or fourth sermon before my wife believed I was called. <laughs> and so uh, it, it was paralyzingly terrible. But I knew that I was called, so I had to step out by faith. But now maybe you say, well, I know I've got some gifts and I'm pretty aware that I've been gifted in these areas, but I don't know if I have a call or not. That's why I said the gifts and calling of God are without repentance and they're also always in tandem. They're always side by side. So if you got gifts, guess what you're called to use them. And again, the parable in Matthew 25. Matter of fact, Jesus said twice, he said, well done. He said to the one who had five and the one who had two, but it's word for word. Read Matthew 25, verse 21 and verse 23. He says it word for word. Whether you had five and used them or two and used them, he said the exact same words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. And so he's going to, it's going to grow. If I just start with gifts and I don't even know what the call is, it will begin to unfold and I'll run right into my call. So all you have to do is know one half of the equation. I know my gifts, but not sure of a call. Guess what? Use the gifts, it's going to grow and you're going to know what your call is. You're called, but don't understand whether or don't believe you have any gifts. You do. So you step out on the call and start moving that way. And guess what? The gifts start unfolding. God has simply bundled everyone, Jew and Gentile, in the category of unbelief. He said, okay, I'm just going to count you all as unbelievers. And the word in the New King James is disobedience. It's the very same word used as unbelief. And so that I can have mercy on all of you. And this last passage here, the unsearchable or beyond tracing out the transcendence of God. And we get into the theology class in, in another session altogether. We'll talk about transcendence and eminent, that God is other than us, and he is also among us. So transcendent is a word that he is beyond knowing. He's transcendent. And Paul discusses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 12, where he says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered to the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit, and he did that by moving inside of us. Remember, Christianity is living life from the inside out. So this unknowable, unknowable God has moved inside of a finite being. But he's telling us here, is transcendent. Now, there's a lot of people who will add, eyes not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, and his ways are past finding out. We found out here that he is way beyond us. What we know about him, he has revealed to us. That's why we need the Bible, and that's why we need the teacher to move inside of us, the Holy Spirit, to help us entire <laughs> to, to understand the book that he wrote. Because all scripture is given by in spirit of God. That's the word inspiration. Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the author of the book. And the wonderful thing is you have the book. And then you also have the spirit who is the author of the book living inside of you. So if you're reading the book and you say, I don't understand that. You just ask, Holy Spirit, would you illuminate me? Would you help me understand because he is the one who wrote it. <laughs> you, get, you get to talk directly to the author, which is a very powerful truth. 
we do not inform or instruct God. And I think that's really important because there's a lot of people. First of all, they're a little afraid to pray to God because they think, well, uh, I don't want him to know. There's a lot of people who won't confess their sins to God because they say, well, I just hate to confess those sins to God. Some people are afraid of prayer because they think something's going to be uncovered to God. No, he already knows. Jesus even said this about prayer in Matthew chapter 6. He knows what you have need of before you ask. He's the all-knowing God. So you're not going to be informing God. It's amazing how we think we're informing God. We talk to God about our troubles. And we think we're telling him something he doesn't know. Now listen, he wants you to talk to him about it. Read the Psalms. Why do we love and gravitate toward the Psalms? Because we often see this wonderful thing happen. David starts off with this miserable things happening and I got this enemy and everybody wants to kill me and nobody likes me and everybody hates me. But he says, and then I look to you, O Lord. <laughs> and he begins to acknowledge the greatness of God. And we don't want to miss that last verse here in chapter 11. Because notice, everything, and, and I've, I've highlighted in your notes these words, and I've put it in bold and then italics and underlined because I want you to see this. Everything is through him. Everything is from him. And everything is to him. And everything is for his glory. Everything in this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is going to come through him but it emerges from him. In chapter 10, we saw this. This message of faith is not to say, who is going to go up there and bring him down? Because Christ has come already. We're not begging him. And by the way, I'm not praying heaven down. This is really important. Well, I'm not praying heaven down. He said this righteousness, which is a faith, is not saying, who's going to ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from the above? Or who's going to descend into the deep and bring him up from the grave? He said, no, what does it say? The word is nigh you, in your heart and in your mouth. That is the word of faith that we preach. God has come to us and it is through him and to him and for his glory that everything he's going to do. But then Paul told us where it's hidden. He said, we have this treasure, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. And the treasure that he had just described in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4 was this treasure of the glory of God as it shines in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in dirt, in earthen vessels. Isn't that the human experience? The human experience started when God was playing in the dirt. He squeezed some dirt together and he breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. God still wants to breathe life into your clay pot through your earthen vessels. And really his only plan right now to be seen by the world. Remember my friend who asked, I want you to prove to me the existence of God. Do you know he was talking to God's body? Because we are the body of Christ. The only way people are going to see this invisible God is through the visible church, through his people. Would you respond? I want to pray for you right now that you would open and surrender your body because we're going to see that when we open chapter 12 in our next lesson. But let's pray right now. Lord, I pray for every person here. Thank you that it's in you we live and move our and have our being and that you want to work through us and everything comes from you and it is to you and for you that we want to glorify you. You said that we were not chosen because of our goodness. You said that it is 
<laughs> You've chosen the foolish things and the weak things to confound those that are mighty so that no flesh could glory in your presence. And we ask you that right now you would work through us to manifest your glory and speak through us to tell your story so that people will hear, people will believe, and people will be saved as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I can't wait to get into our next lesson.